I'm Jerry Nelson, the interim chair at University of California Orthodontic Division. I produced this presentation for the attendees to the 2014 CareStream user group meeting. We've used the CareStream 9300C at UCSF for four years, taking just under 2,000 scans a year. So overall, I think a very good record both in the reliability and the backup. Here's uh, the UCSF Dental Clinic that I graduated from in 1965. I, had, I was lucky to have a window uh, chair that I could look out over the Golden Gate Bridge and the entry to the bay. It was uh, really quite wonderful. About 10 years ago, we renovated <clears throat> our clinic, and uh, this is what we have, 10 years old, but still functioning really quite well. What I want to do today is discuss the use of CBC te technology in an orthodontic practice, the, both the diagnostic value, the radiation exposure, the liability, and some on the economics of it. Um, I want to review some research, both the research we've done and uh, some research in the literature, and then uh, show you a systematic approach to reviewing the CBCT. There's a bit of um, controversy now uh, surrounding the CBC, use of CBCT in orthodontics, particularly on a routine basis. Uh, I just wanted to point out that this same controversy occurred when head films were first introduced. Uh, Broadbent, who did the tons of research, took these films on children every single year of frontal and lateral for uh, until they were 21. And there was some controversy about it. And of course, the radiation exposure for those head films was, you know, like 50 microsieverts. Uh, now we're under five microsieverts. Um, but it was a, a new thing, and it was an interesting technology that we've fully adopted in orthodontics. Broadbent was fascinating in that he also set up a system of um, orienting the models to the cephal cephalograms so that you could really see what you're going and coordinate both the head film and the, the model setup. A lot of people are telling us what to do with these CVCTs. The, the American Dental Association, the American Association of Orthodontists, and British Orthodontic Society, and then the journals come out with articles uh, telling us uh, how to be careful and the National Council on Radiation. So a lot of information. And what are we supposed to do with it is part of the question. Well, the research that's been done has mostly been done on adult phantoms. A phantom is a model like this that has sensors in it that measure the exposure that the patient might uh, feel in different parts of the head and the sensors are adjusted to coordinate like with the thyroid or the palate or whatever. Um, most of the research has been done with adult phantoms which is not typically what we do um, and, we, and basically we don't do research we don't do our treatment the way the research is done because the machine, machines are set at full speed they, sh they shoot a whole head and um, you know, we can moderate these things. We can adjust things to reduce the exposure. For example, the settings. We can take a smaller field of view. We don't have to take a view of the whole head. Um, we do want a head film, and we can take a separate head film, which is a very low uh, exposure. The power can be controlled by the operator and the exposure time. So those are important controls. And then the hardware you happen to choose for your office um, you know, should have all these modern uh, features that are listed here. The one thing that many of the machines do not do is horizontal collimation, and I'm going to explain that in a later uh, slide. But let's look at the field of view. This is one way to cut down on your exposure, and, and this is what we use. We use this 10 by 10 with the idea we're trying to get from condyle to chin. So in a small person, a 10 by 10 will do that. <clears throat> we take 2D head film along with this. In a larger person, we really need the 11 by 17 in order to get the condyle in 
in place. <clears throat> So the horizontal collimation is another way that you can cut down the exposure. Now, uh, all the machines will allow you to adjust the cylinder vertically. You can move the dot down or the bottom up and that way take a uh, sort of wide uh, uh, column anywhere in the head. But mo many machines can't do the horizontal where you can move the right end or the left end and what that allows you to do is take the smallest field of view, this say a five by five centimeter, and orient it so you can look at just one quadrant, and uh, or one or the third molar or some specific area. So that means that the exposure you're doing is like a set of bite wings, uh, but so much more informative. So. The field of view and resolution is coordinated. In other words, if you reduce the field of view, you will reduce the, uh, you'll increase the resolution. So, for example, the 10 by 10 I was telling you about is uh, 0.183 millimeter uh, size voxel. Uh, if we cut that in half to 5 by 5, then the resolution goes to 0.09, which means that the resolution is better, the voxel is smaller. <clears throat> it's just like the um, regular photo pixel size. The smaller the better. Um, so we've got this advice, we know something about it. How do we order a CBC T scan? When do we decide to do that? I think there's two options. First option is you just do a clinical exam you do a, a history, and um, after you've looked at everything carefully, you decide, okay, I think we need uh, just a pano, or I think we need a CBCT, or we need periapicals. Well, I can think of 11 reasons to do the uh, CBCT. First one is delayed eruption. If a tooth doesn't grow in on schedule, there is a reason, and you need to figure out what the reason is, obviously. Usually it's a supernumerary, right? Um, I think a CBCT is the best choice here, since any other image um, that you took, you'd have to take additional ones. And also, one supernumerary? Maybe not. Might be others. <clears throat> Another reason is mouth breathing. When I see a patient who is an obvious mouth breather, um, it's a red flag for me. There, there's so many new articles, dozens of articles, talking about the airway. And the reason it is is because of, of the CBCTs that are taken now uh, more on a more routine basis that we, we really know more about the airway. And the treatment planning has to take into account if a patient can't breathe through their nose, do we want to do some expansion to try and help that get better. Another reason, number three, is ankylosis. I think when you have an ankylos situation, the oral surgeon might have to be involved and they're going to need some decent uh, x-rays in order to know exactly what to do. Um, so I would say avoid all the extra images that you might take and just take the CBCT. Asymmetry is another one. An asymmetry can occur anywhere from the eyes down to the chin and so you need to figure out, okay, where is the problem? Is it going to require upper jaw surgery or just lower jaw surgery? Can, do we have to do some orthodontics prior? Um, all those questions can be answered with adequate imagery. And the pano Ceph just cannot tell you the answer. Even pano Ceph and AP head film is not quite up to it. Uh, some trauma, number five. I think trauma is another reason to take a... 3D x-ray because you, you, while you might take a periapical and see that the tooth root itself is, is or is not fractured, but if there's an alveolar fracture, can you see that in a periapical or a pano? Not necessarily, uh, but I do think with the CBCT you could take cross-sections and really verify it. In our craniofacial patients, we have a very strong craniofacial department at UCSF, and CBCT is really what we prefer to take with these patients who are going to need bone grafting, may have some supernumerary missing teeth that need to be sorted out, um, 
So the 3D x-ray is, is definitely a necessity. Another one, number seven, multidisciplinary treatment. I think that in these cases where you're working with a periodontist and a prosthodontist, this is how you get the best communication and collaboration in order to plan the best treatment. I mean, this patient has missing teeth, has retained baby teeth, midline shift, uh, asymmetry, lots of things going on that require uh, good collaboration. Our orthognathic patients are almost all treatment plans using 3D x-rays because that's how we can really determine which jaws need to move where and when. Um, for, for orthognathic planning we do use the full head scan so the patient is subjected to more exposure but for good reason and I think it really benefits the patient. Whenever I see an, a supernumerary erupted supernumerary I think okay is there another one up there and I think then I want to take the 3D x-ray to verify that that. And this patient actually does have another one. I'll show you it later. When I'm planning uh, temporary anchorage devices, I like to have the CBCT. I want to really know what kind of space I have for the device. I want to know what the cortical plate looks like. I want to know what the distance from the buccal wall to the lingual wall of the alveolar process is so I can know what size of TAD I can use. Am I limited to a six millimeter or can I put an eight or even ten in there? Um, and then the thin biotype patient. Now this this may not be intuitive to you but uh, we our research has shown that these kind of patients not only have thin uh, gum tissue but they also have thin alveolar housing and very little bone over the roots and that's something I think you have to take into account. So, if none of these conditions exist, I think you can, in good conscience, just do a 2D series and go from there. Of course, once you take the 2D series, you may discover that you're going to need to take a CBCT anyway. So, so that's the first option, is look for these particular 11 conditions that might tell you, yes, let's take a 3D x-ray. What's the second option? Well, the second option is just, I think, sort of more routinely take a 3D x-ray that is basically a 3D panoramic, or panoramic and then take the 2D since it's such a low exposure type of x-ray. Ours, you know, this new uh, care stream that we have is like under five microsieverts. A 7 pan, 2D 7 pan, or 25 microsieverts. So uh, if you take a 7 pan and then you might need a periapical or some TMJ, uh, you're going to get uh, over the microsieverts that we use for the CBCT and, and uh, lateral head film. And remember, every week we receive 200 microsieverts from the sky. Um, and I think it's good to remind patients that that's just the norm. This is a very small exposure when you think of it. We've learned a number of things from uh, our research <clears throat> at UCSF. And this is the list I'm going to uh, go through. We graduate five residents every year from our three-year program. And they all do a master's project in craniofacial biology. And, and a master's thesis at UCSF, it, it's no joke. I mean, the, there's some world-class researchers there that are mentoring some of these research projects. A lot of our projects are with CBCT, and pretty much 30% of our theses in the last five years have been published in peer-reviewed journals, including the AGODO. The, f the first one, accuracy. Um, Scott Strateman was a resident uh, for us and he published an article, one of the very first articles on accuracy in CBCT. He, he put fiducials in some bones then shot x-rays of them and found that the linear and angular measurements are very very accurate, very reliable. He's in Texas uh, in his orthodontic practice that was started by his grandfather. I went and visited him in New Bronzeville. It was uh, very fun to see him. And then another accuracy article I really liked was this one where they took some cadavers and um, took images 
first with soft tissue in place, then they took off the soft t t tissue and took some CBCTs, and then they simulated some dehiscence and took some CBCTs, and they found, and, and then they did this at different uh, resolutions too. So with the 0.3 millimeter voxel size that we use, they found that the cortical bone would would be one millimeter short of reality. So you see the CBCT, there could be a millimeter of bone there that you can't see. So basically the CBCT underrepresents the cortical bone layer by one, one, mil, uh, one millimeter. So then superimposition is another thing that's happening with 3D x-rays and will become much more important in our treatment analysis as we go along. Um, Andrew Harner, uh, a 2005 graduate, published this article in 2009 that was really one of the first articles to study superimposition of craniofacial sets. And um, now there's just dozens of these articles. And one of our recent ones was done by Christian Solom, just published uh, last year. Uh, he graduated in 2011, and this was a really neat article showing superimposition on the cranial base. The article was uh, talking about retraction, MOS retraction of the upper anterior teeth and, and the effects on the lip posture uh, using TADs. Uh, but his system is good, very visual, it really is. Another area um, of research that has really piqued my interest is the palatal, I mean the uh, bone housing around the teeth and what happens during orthodontic treatment. And my buddy Jay Park, who's chair at A.T. Steele University in Mesa, Arizona, he did this study showing that when you retract teeth, you tracked up her anterior teeth, the bone on the lingual actually becomes quite reduced compared to where it was at the start. So this is something that's a little nerve-wracking and we have to pay some attention. And Our particular study with one of my residents, um, Na Huang, uh, showed some important difference between low angle and high angle cases as far as the bone housing goes. If you want to move teeth labial or lingually, I think routine slices of the bone housing, both upper and lower, is a, is a good thing. Anyway, Nas showed that in the high angle cases, the amount of bone support around those lower incisors is limited, whereas in low angle cases, a little more leeway. Another study at UCSF by Cameron Navadara, uh, which he published a couple years after he graduated, in 2009 was one of the first sort of studies of airways and um, he compared conventional he head films and CBCT and found that the conventional head films actually give you a pretty good sagittal view of the airway but doesn't tell you very much about anything else the volume I mean there may be some constrictions that you can't see that are not in the sagittal plane that, that are in the frontal plane um, it doesn't tell you too much about the nasal airway, which, which we can now do with CBCT. Another uh, area we've done some research on this, but this was a this was not our project uh, that was in the AJODO last year, showing that uh, during expansion, what happens to the buccal bone? Well, this was interesting because it showed that in slow expansion that you, uh, res you, you lose more buccal bone than you do with rapid. So rapid expansion actually results in less buccal bone loss. So there's another expansion study that we did with Dr. Kim. Uh, these are some patients in Korea. We kind of collaborated on this study. And this bone-borne expansion was interesting because it was supported by four um, implants, TADs, and uh, which is more than other articles have done. Other articles with bone borne expansions shown, show no difference really between bone borne and tooth borne, but Dr. Kim's study showed that there was a difference. There was a lot less bone loss on the buckle, and uh, it just the skeletal change was more also. 
So the study's in press. I mean, it's not, it's not in the AJO deal yet, but it will be later this year. Root angulation is another thing that's been looked at. Now, we know that panoramic images of the root angula angulations are not so good. I mean, that's been shown by uh, studies comparing skulls and then take a pano and compare the measurements. Well, we compared CBCT. Linda Young did this when she was a resident and found that the pano puts all the posterior, upper posterior roots too far distal, puts the upper anterior roots to the mesial. And then the lower arch puts all the roots a little bit mesial of where they actually are. So she, we took the two x-rays and then she measured them physically on this model that has little fiducials in it. We take a progress x-ray to look at root, uh, root positions and we use the CBCT and you might say, well, sheesh, why are you taking such high exposure? But actually we back off on the exposure. It's taken at about nine months. Um, and we take it at a four mil voxel, so it's a little less resolution. And uh, the e exposure to the patient is only about 20 microsieverts or less. So that there, that's actually less than the panoramic, but the information is so much better. We'll see an image of that later. So that's six things we know. And there's a lot more, um, you know, that uh, root resorption seen better and that TAD, the best buccal sites, and so on. And we could look at research all day because more and more articles come out every month. But I wanted to talk about how do you use 3D x-rays in orthodontic diagnosis? Now here's what we do at UCSF. We, we get the 2D head film. We get the 3D pano. We take photos, models, clinical exam, and history, and then our radiology technologist, Eddie Garcia, he puts together a series of images that, you know, they're static. He doesn't print them out. We, they're, they're in our server, so uh, they go into Dolphin so that we can easily look at them. And then we also, he provides us with the DICOM series and the um, CareStream 3D software so that we can go through all the slices in all three planes of space. So that's the basic review of the records we do. And then we can assemble the problem list, the goals, and the treatment options. So these are the example of the photos that we would typically use. And then the intraoral photos, just, just for, as all of us do. Um, and then these are the images that Eddie makes for us. He, uh, lays out these volumetrics on the top, takes a, a pano a, that has a 20 millimeter thickness to include all the teeth, where you get a view of the sinuses and the condyles, and then he takes the um, transaxial slices of the lower and upper um, anterior regions, and then two side, uh, you know, 90 degree views of the condyles so that we can look at the joint space, at the uh, condyle cortical plate and, and the status of the TMJ. And then we have our 2D head film from which we can take the ordinary measurements that we all use. Uh, and then we also have an AP head film that comes out of the 3D series and you can see it's not the full head. Uh, and you don't need the full head. You really need from eyes down in order to evaluate that symmetry. Then we've looked at all those static images and now the resident goes through the uh, 3D images in the CS software. So first thing he does is take the volumetric and sort of get it lined up by lining up the eye sockets so that uh, it's just a measure of symmetry if we can get the right and left eye sockets, so they're basically superimposed. And then we can uh, flip the image around and take a look at it, and, and that'll give us some idea of the asymmetry. You can see that the lower left mandible is kind of uh, larger. Then we'll go through each of the three planes of space and just travel through. And as we travel through, we can move our pointer down to this area here and um, that will, and then by running your little mouse wheel back and forth, you can really do very um, close and accurate and, and 
detailed movements. So we go through, we look at where the uh, cervical stack is, try and get an idea on that. We look at the sinuses. We'll go uh, through and look at the airway. Again, looking at the cervical bones to make sure that all looks pretty good. And you can go to your mouse wheel and uh, adjust it for fine tuning. Uh, and then we continue on and we go through the other sinus and see that it's got a mucus retention cyst in there. Uh, so a little glob of fluid and, uh, whoops, computer's jumping here. I should fix that. And then as we go through, look at the other condyle, look at the joint space, cortical plate, and then we'll start looking through another plane space, the uh, frontal slice, and we're just going through again, looking at the cervical bones briefly, and passing forward until we see the condyles, to get another view of the condyles, looking for joint space and cortical issues and medullary bone, and then keep traveling through. We will uh, again sort of pass through the sinuses and see another view of our mucus area and uh, then continue on through the anterior region. Then we can go down to the yellow line here on the lower right and start passing from um, bottom to top. And we'll go through the mandible and um, so we're sort of looking at the airway at this point and also watching our cervical the cervical bone, the neck bones, and then until we come up to the condyle, we get another view of the condyle, and we can start seeing the sinuses here, um, and keep traveling through and until we sort of get to the top of our imagery. There's the mucus cyst from another view. So that's going through the three planes of space. Then we go to the, our next image, which is, I just wanted to show you how the panoramic is traced. So we click that icon on the lower left over there. And then we can just draw a line through the arch in order to develop our panoramic. Now this line right now just has a one millimeter thickness, so it really doesn't get everything. So you have to go and open the thickness to maybe 20 millimeters so that you can really see everything you need to see. And then you can adjust all these little um, marks so that you get the best view of the condyle uh, and everything else. And so once you get all these little red dots adjusted for the best undistorted view, um, then we can move to the next step. And so I'm taking a few minutes here to get some adjustments. And, Every time I adjust it, I kind of look at the roots and the structures that I'm interested in to sort of make sure that it's the least distorted view of it. And I think, you know, as, as accurate as these things are, I will say going through the slices in the three planes of space is much more accurate. This panoramic is, is good, but it's not as good as you would like it to be. Then once you've identified everything, you can change the density to maybe get a little better view of it. And then another feature of the CS software I think that is pretty cool um, is the TMJ and, uh, view. And so we go through that too to take a look at things. and. And what you do is just sort of mark the area where you where you want to look and orient that little crosshash until you get the jaw joint oriented. And then you can go down and, and actually look at the uh, the volumetric and, and even then you can change the uh, coloration of it so that you really do get the whole view. So I think that's a really nice little portion of the software. I, I, enjoy it. I think that it helps us a lot. So then what we do is we have all the information we need, then we set up the diagnosis, the goals, and, and our treatment plan in much in the same way that probably everybody has a version of this in some way, but this is how we 
teach the residents to do it. So partway through treatment, we then um, take a progress CBCT. Now, you you know you want to know if the roots are reasonably parallel. You want to know about root resorption. So this X-ray, which is actually less well, it's it's less uh, patient exposure than a, a panel would be. It is. Um, it gives us much better information because we can rotate this image around and look at the roots in, in all the, in all dimensions, and we can go through slices too. The res the resolution is about uh, 0.4 millimeters, so it's not as good as the one we take at the beginning or the end. <clears throat> it's a 10 by 10, so it doesn't typically get the condyle in a, an adult or in a large teenager. We dial back the power to about 70 kVs and the milliamps are two, and the time is the shortest the care stream will take, which is 6.2 seconds. And this is the kind of image you get. <clears throat> now, are other orthodontic programs teaching 3D x-rays? And the answer is yes, they are. Um, my friend uh, Jay Park at uh, A.T. Still University in Mesa, Arizona, um, they did a study on this. And by the way, Jay Park is now the editor of the PCSO Bulletin. It's a job that I did for 20 years. And if you want to go see the PCSO Bulletin, it, it, it's free. You just go to www.pcsortho.org, and it has some nice things. There's always a case report. There's always Earl's Pearls, which, and, which is now called Pacific Pearls because Earl kind of stopped doing it. And uh, then there's Jerry's Gems, which is a practice management tip that I usually put in there. And, you know, the problem with CBCT in the orthodontic programs is who sets the pr protocols for the use of the device? So the state law in Massachusetts, for example, only MDs can order a CBCT. So that's a barrier. I mean... If you need a CBCT, you have to go, okay, call the physician and have them order it. At the University of Washington, Greg Huang told me that this their unit up there is owned by the radiology department, and they set the protocol for everything. At UCSF, we own our own care stream, and we determine how it's used. So I think that if you're thinking of getting a CBCT at a university, I think... If it's possible, you can um, buy it yourself. That's the way to go. Anyway, Dr. Park's study showed that mostly the programs are using CBCT for impactions, craniofacial patients, and TMJ. Now, they didn't ask the question about orthognathic diagnosis and treatment planning, and we use it a lot for that, too. Um, so that was interesting. So most of the programs actually are using these things, uh, and these are West Coast programs. And then um, they did also ask the question about who reads them. And in the West, Western United States, they found that um, the radiologists are uh, the, in the West Coast, that it's mostly the residents and the faculty who read these um, reports. And in the Eastern U, yes, it's mostly radiologists. You know, we're advised by the AO and ADA to educate ourselves adequately or use a radiologist. I think an important way to deal with this is avoid taking the large field CBCT. If you want to educate yourself, there's lots of ways to do it, but one there's one book that I like by Dale Miles that has a whole dis set of dissections that are matched by the x-ray slices. So you see side by side, and one page is the dissection, and the other page is the slice in the same area. So this is really a, a very useful book. And then there's a YouTube by Ryan Kazimi, who's a, a radiologist in D.C., and if you just Google reading CBCT images, you'll come up with it, and he takes you through uh, all the slices and, and shows you all sorts of incidental findings. Now, incidental findings, that's an important phrase because uh, that's what we need. You know, we're used to looking at root positions, supernumeraries, missing teeth, whatever, and ankylosis, but 
incidental findings are the things that we're not used to looking at. And if you put incidental findings into a Google search, you come up with 10 pages. If you put incidental findings with CVCT, that is, 10 pages of various sites that you can go look at. Uh, so I think it's important. Ludlow, who has done a ton of research on patient exposure, also has done some on incidental findings and found that airway, calcifications, and bone, and TMJ, that's really the most of it. Um, and I think airway is... Let's look at some of those incidental findings. I've got a collection here. Um, one of the most common, I, I think, is sinusitis, where, which could result in thickening or fluid retention. And sometimes it's associated with a calcification called an antrolith. Um, and it may come from an inhaled particle that then attracts precipitation. If it's small, it probably doesn't do anything. If the larger ones can irritate and cause inflammation. Another one, another fairly common one, actually very common one, is concha bullosa. And um, it's a pneumatized cavity in the, the concha. And almost half the population has this. So uh, it, it's almost normal. But if it gets really big, it can cause some problems. It can cause a deviated septum, for example. Um, does it, is it associated with uh, fluid retention in the sinus? It, yes, it seems to be, but you know, not seriously. So some are, some include mucus retention. Another, and I'm going to the less in, less common ones. This is a, another one that uh, happens is that the stylohyoid ligament becomes calcified. And these pain, these things can cause pain. The patient turns their head. It can cause a sore throat or even tinnitus. It's pretty rare, but we've seen it in our patients at UCSF. And it can actually, weirdly, even affect the carotid arter artery and press against it. So it's an important finding, but not one that uh, you're likely to see in the teenagers. <clears throat> Another one. Now, this one is a common one. Um, this range of percentages, this, this was a systematic review, so the range of percentages re is in regard to the variety of articles that were considered. One thing I found out about deviated septums is that it, is, um, it can be associated to trauma, like a baseball in the face, or even um, compression during childbirth. So that's, uh, that's an interesting etiology of devi deviated septum septums. It also can be associated with Marfan sy syndrome, which is a connective disorder that has a peculiar collapsed maxilla and other kinds of morphology, include, and then things go with it, snoring, mouth breathing, loss of sense of smell. TMJ, there's lots of uh, things that we are finding in the TMJ, and um, you know, why worry about the TMJ? Well, we have to. Uh, there's, there's nothing like informing before you perform. We can now warn a patient that the jaw joint's compromised and there might be some symptoms as we proceed with orthodontic treatment that's not even related to orthodontic treatment. The problem was there at the beginning. Also, when we look at the TMJ, we can catch a COCR discrepancy. If the jaw joint space doesn't look right, it may be because the condyle is displaced. David Hatcher is uh, uh, one of our faculty at UCSF, and he originated this sort of standard, this diagnostic chart, which I think is really very helpful. The normal being up top on the left has a normal cortical plate, normal density of the medullary bone, and a normal shape. And whereas you go to the sclerotic one and uh, the medullary bone is a little bit thick and dense, and then you see the flattening. Well, we see flattening all the time and tend not to worry about it too much, but it's something that we can tell the patient that this is not completely normal, so we we'll keep an eye on it. When I see uh, the next one, erosion, when I see a loss of cortical plate, that's a patient I'm not actually going to start orthodontic treatment on until that repairs itself. I might refer them to the oral surgeon to monitor too. The 
osteophytes or the bee king, uh, is, which is second to last layer, <clears throat> I'm not too worried about. Um, but again, warn the patient. And then subchondral, subchondral cysts uh, certainly is something that we do want to pay attention to and refer the patient. Okay, let's look at a couple of less common <clears throat> cardiac artery inclusions. Um, calcium deposit in the artery, that's a marker for cardiac disease. And so with some of your adult patients, if you see it, I think this is an important thing to take note of. The calcification reduces the elasticity in the uh, arterial wall. It is also associated with Marfan syndrome. And by the way, Abraham Lincoln was uh, had Marfan syndrome, which is uh, typically associated with this kind of occlusion, very collapsed maxilla. Another less common salivary gland, gland calcifications. Um, this sialolithiasis can hurt during meals. Um, and it could be associated with chronic dehydration too. And even less common, maybe, oh, where did that implant go? And here it is traveling into the sinus. And then finally, mom thought Charlie had lost his marbles, but we were able to show, no, he still has them. So <laughs> we have, um, uh, Supernumerary teeth is another thing that we are very concerned with. It's CBT is often used to plan treatment for that. And uh, it just happens. So what is our liability when we order a CBCT? Well, uh, are we staying within the standard of care? Well, the easiest way to, I mean, the this, this shortest, most concise phrase I've ever heard for the standard of care is, the level of knowledge, skill, and care of a reasonable dentist. We're not really obligated, uh, to, uh, we are obligated not to harm our patients, I mean. And one way of harming a patient is delaying the diagnosis. I mean, if we don't have adequate records and the diagnosis is delayed because we didn't see something, I think that's, that's harm. We're responsible to diagnose disease that falls within the scope of our license, and that means all the disease or lesions in the jaws and related structure. And then once a lesion is noted, either you diagnose or you refer. If the patient refuses to take a CBCT, okay, then what's your choice? You can refuse to treat or you can document that they have refused to take it and accept the risk. And I think when it comes to um, interpreting x-rays, you need to be competent and so that means take some and the AAO says take accredited continuing education to maintain your competence and attend to legal responsibilities in terms of don't overexpose the patients and provide proper informed consent and then in consent includes what the x-ray is what it's doing and what the risks are or includes what the risks are if they're not taking your advice and getting an x-ray so here are the course code credits for this course. Um, and I have a second portion of this Atlanta Users Group Lecture, um, which you can also download or listen to. Thank you very much for this opportunity. I do appreciate uh, being able to share what we're doing at UCSF. This is Jerry Nelson. I am from the uh, orthodontic division at the University of California in San Francisco. This is part two of the presentation I prepared for the CareStream Users Group meeting in Atlanta in March 2014. We discussed in part one uh, CBCT in orthodontic practice and I want to continue this topic. In the second part, I actually will review some of the clinic cases from our clinic. One of the things uh, we talked about is that your radiology technologist can present to you some static images that help you in your diagnosis, but I also emphasize that doing a clear review of your images is really important. Here we have a patient with an impacted canine tooth 
And when we start spinning around and looking at the details, then we can appreciate there is no wisdom teeth on the other side, but uh, when we get a better look at the lingual of the patient's right side, we see that there's yet another molar down there uh, on the lingual. So I think scrolling through your uh, images is really an important part of the diagnosis. Let's just review again the field of view that you might use in orthodontic treatment. The largest care stream uh, 9300 field of view includes nasion. So this is the 13.5 by 17 centimeter field of view. And it's a uh, really appropriate for orthodontic surgery. Actually, I think it's a necessity for evaluation of facial asymmetry. We use the 11 by 17 for orthodontics, the medium field of view, we can see the anatomy from the brain case condyle down to the chin. And we use this uh, view for larger individuals for orthodontic planning. We also take a 2D uh, cephalogram in order to look at the measurements in relationship to the research that's been done over the years. Our 10 by 10 centimeter view is really good for mixed dentition reviews or just for the smaller individual. The voxel size is less than uh, two tenths of a millimeter so the detail is really pretty good uh, and this replaces the 2D pano and provides a lot more information. Then we take a C, uh, 2D Ceph, our head film, in order to look at the overall profile of the skeleton. A smaller field of view gives better resolution. So what resolution is useful for orthodontic diagnosis? Well, studies have shown that 0.3 or even 4 tenths of a millimeter voxel side is, is really reliable for orthodontic diagnosis and treatment plan. But better than a 4 tenths voxel size is, I think, very helpful. And for interdisciplinary treatment, it's really um, actually quite important. So for interdisciplinary, we usually get the smaller field of view, which is less than a tenth of a millimeter um, voxel size, and really the detail, the periodontal membrane, the pulpal canal, all is, becomes quite visible. At point three, uh, none of these, I mean the periodontal membrane is not so visible, but we can see all the roots and we really can see the bone level, so for orthodontic diagnosis I think it is really okay. So this is what we would do for that. The 5x5 five five is good for interdisciplinary and you can um, tailor these views for the project that's in, that is planned and they're easily constructed just to the best advantage. So should we use the panogram or periapicals as a screening tool? Maybe that's the way to uh, first take a screening panogram and say, okay, do we need the CBCT? And I don't think it's such a good idea. They're very distorted, and, and the magnification is variable throughout the panogram. The layers of structures are superimposed. Uh, the exposure is moderate, 24 microsieverts. But then if you have to add full mouth x-rays or even bite wings, it starts to get up there, and I think when you compare that to uh, CBCT, you're actually going to do more exposure to the patient than your CBCT would have done. And if you take a 2D x-ray, you might still need to be 3D. So, a lot of lesions will just be undetected with your panoramic because the distortion, particularly around the upper and lower anterior teeth, is, is pretty bad. The, um, I know the attorneys, I've done quite a bit of expert witness work, and the, one of the first things the attorney does who's suing the dentist is say to the patient, let's go get a 3D x-ray, see if there's anything they're missing. So I do think that um, that's something to consider. I mean, the families worry about the radiation. It's true. They come in with anxiety. Just, so I think your role is just to educate the patients uh, about what the facts are. 
Let's look at some panoramic films that might uh, have missed uh, some things that show up in the 3D X-ray. Here's one that has some supernumeraries, and they're they're not obvious. I mean, are those supernumeraries supernumeraries around the upper left by cuspid area? Maybe the upper right molar apical area, um, or the lower anterior where we can't really see things because they're quite obscured. But nope, they're up near the apex of the central incisors. And now that you have this 3D image, you can see that in the panel, yeah, maybe a couple shadows up there that would represent these two supernumeraries. This panogram shows a lesion, but that's about, well, two lesions, really. It's about all you can say about it. But really, where is it? I mean, if the oral surgeon is going to go in and do some treatment, they need more information than this. Um, which which side of the mandible should they approach this lesion? Is it through the cortical plate? So when you take a 3D to view this, you can actually see exactly where these lesions are. This is a periapical of teeth after a traumatic injury. And there is you know, no real evidence of root. I mean, there's some faint little lines in there, but is that a root fracture? I don't think it's very clear. Um, when we took a CBCT, it was very clear that the root was not fractured, but the alveolar plate was fractured, and that didn't really appear in the um, periapical x ray. So when a patient has a traumatic injury to a teeth, a high-resolution CBCT, that's the image of choice in my, in my thinking. This is a great article in the AJODO. Um, and here's a pano. There's a supernumerary in there, but where? Is it in the lower left, uh, upper left? Maybe the upper right wisdom second molar. Maybe that's why that second molar is so delayed. Um, so let's take a look. Well, here it is in the nasal cavity. So let's go back. That's not very obvious, is it? Um, I think the panoramic really failed to spot this one, but there it is. And I think that's really important for the orthodontist to be able to find that for the patient. Second case involves a root fragment that was left behind after an extraction. There's at least six extraction sites here. Um, and the root fragment may or may not be a diagnostic problem, but here it is, up mesial to the premolar, distal to the canine. I think we probably would just go ahead and move our teeth and monitor the situation, but I think it's good to be able to inform the patient before you carry on. In this paragraph, uh, pentagram, there's a temporary skeletal anchorage device that has gotten away from the uh, clinician. It's a mixed dentition patient, so, you know, kind of early for uh, TSAD perhaps, but uh, in any case, the, the TAD has not where it was first intended. So it's probably slipped into the soft tissue somewhere, and this panel suggests that it's up in the third molar area. But no, it's actually in the sinus and pretty close to the eye socket. So we can see that the panoramic is not extremely helpful there. Here's a case with a fracture in the upper lower jaw, condylar area somewhere. Can you really say where it is? I think that. Uh, it's not as obvious as it is when you take the volumetric image or the slices. This is a patient from UCSF who has a transposed canine and incisor that ran into a bit of trouble. And the CBCT helped sort of resolve or at least address the situation. So the upper left cuspid and lateral are transposed and uh, the patient has a severe malocclusion obviously a lot of crowding midline discrepancy really uh, proclined upper incisors 
and uh, sort of a normal skeletal pattern. So what's needed here is move those upper incisors back, and that's going to take some extractions. The pano shows pretty good bone levels, but the panoramic is pretty obscured. It's not, uh, the detail's just not there in the area of the transposition. Additional x-rays really would have been a good idea, but they were not taken. Um, so four permanent teeth needed to go, and the attending faculty and resident collaborated and took out three premolars and the canine, the transposed canine. And the result was that um, the oral surgeon took out the canine and looked in there and said, wait, that tooth looked like there's some damage on it. So he took a, a small field of view scan. Look at this yellow line. It represents where this slice is. The yellow line in the upper left represents the slice in the lower right. So I'm going to go move the yellow line. And now we see that there is some root resorption on that central. And move the yellow line over further, and we see even more. And now you can see that there's really not much left of the root of that tooth. So what did they do? Well, they went ahead with the braces. It just sort of stayed off of the upper left central incisor with the goal that after the orthodontic treatment, to that tooth would remain until the child was fully grown and an adult, and at some point it would be replaced. Should we take any CBCTs in the mixed dentition, or should we take routine CBCTs in the mixed dentition? I, I really think the question there, you know, kind of depends on what what exposure you're using, but uh, even the exposure for young children is intensified, so I think discretion is important. Taking scans in the mixed dentition really should lie, rely on your clinical assessment. Well, this kid um, has a crossbite, and I feel that mixed dentition treatment for any crossbite is appropriate, posterior or anterior. Crossbites can cause tissue damage, wear on the teeth, and even asymmetrical growth. So this patient um, has some spacing upstairs, mild crowding, and could be treated non-extraction, which that was the game for him. The panoramic showed that the teeth are oriented okay, a little bit tipped in towards the lateral on the upper right. The upper left one's nice and vertical. Um, and the head film showed that the upper incisors are over erupted, roots are kind of forward, and mandibles kind of back. And he's still growing. So this case was treated with one of Earl's pearls, which is, um, this is a 17 square nitai wire that can be flexed in there. It's tied in with the steel wire and the lingual button is there just to keep this steel ligature wire from slipping off the incisal edge of the tooth. And after six weeks, that swings right into place. Um, so that's a really nice technique, but of course, as the crown moves over, the root stays behind. And so now the question is, can we move the root forward, or are we going to bump into the canine? So I was the faculty then, and I said, let's get a CBCT before we move that root forward. And we did. The head film that was taken from the CBCT showed that the upper incisor inclination was better, um, that the tooth had been intruded some. So that's, that's all good, but it doesn't tell us too much about the lateral position. So we're looking at the pano that's extracted from the 3D x-ray, and um, well, the upper right canine root is still kind of tipped in towards that lateral. The left one's still more vertical. You can't really tell if there's any damage going on there or any risk of damage. So we got uh, our 3D x-ray and found that, well, in fact, it was pretty obvious to see that the canine tooth is sitting right on top of the lateral incisor. So at this point, I decided, okay, let's just take the braces off. We will correct that lateral position in phase two and let the cuspid grow in, let the transition occur. Phase two, we'll fix the tooth without uh, worrying about the root being damaged. So this 3D x-ray definitely changed our treatment plan in this case. I did mention that supernumeraries were uh, a good reason to use a 3D x-ray, and I would use it in a mixed dentition case like this, where we had some problems going. He has an anterior crossbite, 
The laterals are emerging on the lingual, and he's got a supernumerary. There's an extra tooth there, and the question is, are there any more? So the models we take serves as a little class three tendency, but he does have a COCR shift, so the class three tendency perhaps is a false one. And in the head film, he doesn't really have a class three skeletal pattern. In fact, his mandible slips forward a little bit. His mandible is somewhat retrognathic. But the head film image doesn't really help us say anything about the supernumerary too. If we look at the panoramic, we can't really see the supernumerary that we could see in the clinic uh, very easily. It looks There's a double image there on the upper right central, so yes, there is. we know there's a supernumerary there. We saw it on the model. But in the x-ray, we find that there's not just one supernumerary, there's actually two. So there's another one up in there, and this definitely wasn't visible in the panel. Let's look back. I mean, yeah, there's a little shadow up there in the midline. That's probably it, but I don't know. It's very visible here, and I think that the, this helped us because we decided, okay, let's get the supernumerary out that's erupted, but let's also get the other one out while we're at it, and that way the patient only had to go through one surgery. This patient has a supernumerary tooth also. She's, you can see all the crowding, the class two molars, and where's the lower canine? It's not there. Um, so we look at the head film and see that the upper incisors are almost horizontal, um, and, but we can see the canine tooth on the lower symphysis area. So we can't really see much more than it's there. We can't see that the problem is. If we look at the head film, which is a little bit obscure or uh, not distinct, and we sort of intensify it, we can see there is, uh, looks like there is a supernumerary overlying the canine tooth. And then if we look at slices and go a little closer, then we can definitely identify that the supernumerary tooth there. And if we look at the volumetric even, we can see that there is the extra tooth. So that has to go uh, as well as some bicuspids in this patient's case. This is a patient with a functional appliance and um, some delayed er eruption. This is pretty ideal for a functional appliance. She's, she's hypodivergent, upright lower incisors, tipped forward upper incisors. Her lower face height can be increased. That wouldn't hurt it at all. She's going to grow, um, grow that mandible. So she's a really good functional appliance patient in my mind. When we look at the pano, there are some things missing. She's missing the lower left uh, premolar, and then the lower right second premolar is a little bit uh, delayed in its development. So we're going to keep an eye on that. She looks basically symmetrical. What we can see of the condyles look fine. So we gave her a bite opening bionator which has an incisal cap to prevent the incisors from erupting, but posteriorly, the plastic is trimmed away from the lowers to allow the first molars and bicuspids to erupt. So open her facial height and also um, reduce the overbite in front. So the overjet and overbite is reduced after 12 months or so. The midline's in, looking pretty good. She still has her uh, retained E on the left and on the right. Um, she's going to need work in the future, obviously. But let's look at the x-rays here. So this x-ray shows that there's quite a bit of overbite, overjet and overbite reduction. Face height's increased. Uh, upper incisors tipped back a lot. Is the condyle seated? Here's the previous amount of overjet and where we came to. You can see some tipping forward of lower incisors and tipping back of upper incisors. And then we see also the ankylose tooth on the left and the premolar on the right has developed some root, but um, the question is now do we extract now on those teeth or do we wait? Well, we made some decisions based on the x-rays, but first I want to look at the condyles. If you notice in this slide that she's class 1 on the right, class 2 tendency on the left. Um, let's look at the condyles. So the one thing that I see here 
in this upper left condyle is it's out of the socket a little bit compared to the right condyle, which is really nicely seated. Now remember, I mean to the patient's left. So the patient's left condyle is nicely seated, and that's where uh, she had the class 2. So that class 2 relationship wasn't particularly corrected with this treatment so far, but on the right side where it says class 1 in the clinic, um, we see the condyle out of the fossa, and that's probably why it's class 1. If that condyle were seated, I think she'd be class 2 on the right side too. So the family was advised that uh, phase 2 was definitely in the cards. Then we looked at the um, ankylos tooth on the left side, kind of interested to see if the alveolar process is being restricted there, and I don't think it is. So we chose to do a little composite buildup just to prevent the upper bicuspid from erupting, and keep an eye on it. We may have to remove that tooth, but I just assume not take it out if I didn't need to. And then on the other side, the question is what to do about the impacted premolar, and I think we've got to get that baby tooth out because look how the premolar is going off towards the buckle. And we really need to correct the eruption vector of that tooth. So the x-ray was very useful to make those decisions. Alveolar integrity is something that is concerning us at UCSF. I'm, I'm convinced that the cortical plate in the front is pretty easily damaged. This is a wonderful woman who really wanted her front teeth moved back. They're protrusive. She broke off the front teeth and wants to have them repaired, and so we need to do some preliminary orthodontics for that purpose, too. And you can see how protrusive her incisors are. So the goal is to move those teeth back significantly, and that means that some premolars are going to be removed. Here you can see the wisdom teeth are sort of stacked up at the end. So her four bys were taken out and teeth retracted, but as they were retracted, and this is just 2D x-rays, but as they were retracted, you can see that the lower incisor roots Crowns tipped back, the roots tipped forward, and they came right through the cortical plate. So now what do you do? So the, I wasn't attending, but the attending said, we better get those teeth tucked back into the bone. So they uh, continued the treatment, tucked the lower incisors in, and started intruding the upper centrals until there's room for the res restoration. And she's now nice class one nice improvement in her facial appearance and the roots are nice and parallel. So this is a nicely treated case, but the interesting thing is that the lower incisors are tucked into the bone. And the bone actually, you can even see, has formed over the facial of the incisors. And here's her before and after pictures, and then here's the before the restorative and then the after restorative. So that came out really nice. She's very happy with that. The next case is when uh, teeth are very crowded after, still after a serial extraction, and the correction worked out really good, a bonded retainer in place, and then the patient gets a habit of playing with their lower right canine tooth, pushing against it and pushing the crown in, it rotates around the bonded retainer, root goes labial, and this is pretty Amazing. Let's look at the radiograms. This was published in the AJODO. The root came right through the cortical plate, and if you look at the slices, you can see in the lower right cuspid even the alveolar nerve traveled along uh, with the root. So the orthodontist said, let's, let's deal with this, and they retreated the case, moved the root back into place, and actually the bone um, healed around that area very nicely. Another thing we worry about is, do we have, are we safe to expand our cases, and are we going to uh, run through the cortical plate? And I really think this is something we need to pay attention to, both in transverse expansion and in proclining the lower incisors. In surgery cases, we like to procline lower incisors prior to surgery so that we can position the jaw in the best way and still have a proper overbite and overjet, so we kind of make the underbite worse before it's, we can make it better, of course. And you can see the amount of decompensation in this patient that one does, and you can also see that the symphysis is pretty thin, and uh, there may not be much bone around those teeth. Well, 
I was involved with my colleague Sung Han Kim and Q Rim Chung, and uh, in this case where they did some corticotomies, you can see how thin the bone is, bone grafting, and replace the tissue, and then to procline the teeth. And the bone healed around those proclined teeth pretty nicely. And you can see from the start in the upper left how thin that symphysis was. Once we get out there, the, there's plenty of bone and it will remodel to a smoother area. This is this next case is a UCSF case about 10 years ago that um, required surgery and it turned out to be upper and lower jaw surgery. Four buys out and lower teeth are tipped back a lot so they're going to be tipped forward uh, prior to the surgery. The bone levels are all you know as healthy as they should be for a young person. She had posterior crossbites, a collapse of the maxilla under, underdeveloped and laterally and sagittally. And the uh, treatment was completed with reasonable occlusion, but not ideal. I mean, it wasn't really a great finish uh, occlusally, but lots of good facial change. And the pano looks decent. I mean, you can see the bone levels aren't bad. And then when you look at the head film, you, this is right when we got our first CBCT and the attending looked at this and said, whoa, that doesn't look like there's much bone there. Let's get a 3D x-ray. Here's where the bone, what the bone looked like before treatment. Here's what, it, and then after treatment, you can see the symphysis is really skinny. So looking at the x-ray, we found that the lower incisor was just basically perched on top of the symphysis. It's my opinion that we're kind of ignorant about the limitations of tooth movement in the alveolus and uh, we're just, we in the past moved our teeth with not worrying about the cortical bone. And we are doing some research which I hope will shed some light on this. So, so this, this gal um, definitely wound up with some problems with those lower incisors. Sometimes teeth do get away from you. Uh, my son is a doctor who sent me this article from the New England Journal and um, tooth in the sinus. I thought that was pretty interesting. It had caused the sinus to actually get deformed, remodeled, and, and also caused a fistula. That's how they, dis that's how they discovered this whole thing. Um, and you can see how the sep symptom is kind of displaced by it as well. This is a, an adult who wanted who had a double protrusion also and wanted to have the teeth retracted. Um, and so the question is, what about the alveolar housing? Well, the lower alveolar housing looks pretty okay. The upper looks worrisome because it looks like there's not much bone over those roots. Um, she had uh, fluorosis. I don't know if you saw that. She had quite a bit of fluorosis because she was in a high fluoride area. And um, so four buys were taken out, and the teeth were retracted um, using TADs, even though the sinuses are pretty in invasive in those roots. And uh, you would think, you know, put a sinus in there, it's going to, I mean, put a TAD in there, it's going to be in the sinus. And I think it probably was. Again, this wasn't my case, but um, this is how much protrusion there was. So the correction came out with, uh, uh, and it's occlusally, it's not great. And, and believe me, we do some really great treatment at UCSF, and I'm showing you some of the ones that are less than ideal just for instruction. Um, as you can see, the TADs were placed to retract the teeth. And um, the, however, you can also see that there's a lot of tissue display and so those upper incisor teeth maybe could have been intruded and also the roots don't seem to be retracted as much as they should be but she was you know happy with the appearance the change but again i just feel like the incisor upper incisor position is problematic but the other issue is she had some pretty severe root resorption now one of the things we know about root resorption is it is when you move teeth into the cortical plate where there is no vascular supply it's it's a problem, and I think the roots will 
cave before the cortical plate does in a lot of cases or at the same time. So I think in this case the reason that she had so much root resorption and here is just uh, and she had a little bit on the lower but not as much but when we look at the slices we can see that the upper incisor roots as they were retracted really did they there just wasn't enough bone so there's they're perched on top of the cortical bone as it is the lower incisor roots uh, looks like they have a little more support but I think that the root end resorption is really a result of contact with the cortical plate here you can see the upper incisors are tipped back. There's no loss of anchorage at all. But the upper incisors, instead of being intruded as well as retracted, just tipped back and, and you've got some resultant extrusion that, that demonstrated more gingival tissue in her smile. Here's a case where there, uh, there's some asymmetry and uh, there's, there's actually a uh, supernumerary in here too, which we'll get into, but when you see a asymmetry like this, he has to say, okay, is there a COCR discrepancy that would change what we've got here? You can see that the lower midline seems shifted off to the right. She's got a crossbite on the right side, mild crowding, and a class two molar on the right. So we look at this, um, head film that's taken from 3D and the skeletal pattern looks pretty balanced. Um, you know, at this point, we the, just looking carefully, we see there, oh, it looks like there's a supernumerary there. But the question is now, if we're going to put braces on and move these teeth around, are, are we going to bump into that? Do we need to get it taken out? Is there any concern? And here we can see the supernumerary in the panoramic. And in the uh, AP head film, you can kind of see it as well. And also, you can see that the patient's jaw looks quite asymmetrical. The midline's off, the crossbite on the right side. Let's look back at the head film. Uh, you know, we can't really see too much from the, con uh, from the panoramic as far as the condylar position. So a good look at the condyle would have, I think, been good with this case. So we took our 3D and sort of looked at things um, rather carefully because the real question for me is, okay, I've got the nerve up here, the pal anterior palatine nerve coming through the bone. I've got my supernumerary tooth. Let's just drag our um, purple line and make it at an angle so we can look at the cross sections right along the axis of that central incisor. Um, it's, most of these programs have a way to either rotate the picture or rotate the x-axis. Uh, and now we'll, we can sort of pass along that area, see how the yellow line's moving, and then you can s see exactly where the nerve and the supernumerary is located. And then once we I've got that, we can uh, zoom in and get a better picture of it. So in this case, we we thought, okay, this these things look too close. And the oral surgeon said, I don't want to take out that tooth. You're just going to have to risk that there might be some root resorption. So that was the decision that we made, was to not take the tooth out and just go ahead with the orthodontics. So we did... Uh, we're concerned about the COCR discrepancy, so we made her a splint to wear for a few weeks and uh, would see her every week and adjust the contact points until they, she, she kept coming back with the same contact points. And then we knew that we were there. And you can see the midlines have lined up. So the unilateral crossbite that she had was really not so unilateral. But the class two relationship on the right side was still something we had to deal with. So she's kind of class two-ish on the right. There's actually still some space here. So if we can just drag forward that lower right, not, not move back the upper right, that would be good. So we put a TAD on the lower left and started moving the teeth forward on the lower right. And that worked out really nicely. The end result was, was good. She actually doesn't really look asymmetrical anymore. But what about the supernumerary and the uh, and the central root, what happened to them? 
Well, as you can see from the CBCT after treatment, the supernumerary and the palatine canal are still adjacent to each other, and the uh, supernumerary tooth in that lower uh, view, you can see that there was a little bit of root resorption, but not certainly not enough to get too worked up about. And what about the asymmetry? Well, she is she still has a little mandibular asymmetry, but you know, not really much, and certainly facially she it, it doesn't show up at all. So this worked out, I think, well for her. I think it's just one more case that shows the value of 3D x-rays in treatment planning. So just to wind this up, I do believe that 3D x-rays are very valuable. It helps us make a better diagnosis and treatment plan in so many cases. Um, I do believe that if using the panogram as a screening tool is just probably not adequate. I, I don't really think it's a, a good choice. I do advise the family of the risk of not using a 3D x-ray. And then uh, we scale the field of view and the power according to how we see the patient's need. And then we use the dental radiologist as we need to. I'd say about 30% of our cases we send the films off to the radiologist for reports. Well, this ends the presentation. Uh, if you have any questions, please contact me at this email address. Um, if you've got a URL reader on your, uh, or QRL reader on your phone, uh, you can snap this picture. It gives you my contact information. And uh, I hope you enjoy uh, your day. Very good. Best wishes to you all.